Hello there, everybody. We're live, I think. And if we're not, I apologize. But, you know, we have never claimed to be professionals on this program. So welcome to the Storytime Network's own Paradox Hour. I can now say that in a channel where we haven't, we do things other than this. So I can actually say this in such a way that this suggests it's not the only thing we do here. Uh, this week, as part of our 2020 retrospective, retrospe words are hard, Word. guys. Retrospective. Retrospective, thank you, Jack. Uh, we're going to be talking about books of 2020, and uh, joining us is a very rare special guest star, Jack. Welcome to the show. Oh, and uh, <laughs> Lord, Laura's <laughs> here. Lord Laura's here, too, you know. Yeah, just in the know. corner yeah no but uh, seriously thank you uh lore for joining us uh we're starting to really get into that whole rotating cast of hosts thing yeah thank you very much for having me uh mill cannot join us today unfortunately but he is probably better off considering that hideous unknowable thing in the corner with its sharp implement of stabbing and slicing be careful. It has a knife. So yes, our show today is going to be split. So yes, our show today is going to be split roughly in two. Uh, first off, we're going to be talking about books that have come out in 2020 that we've been a fan of. And then we're going to move on to just a general uh, books we've read in 2020. Yep. So without further ado, shall we go around the table? Yes, 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 yes. All right. Um, you want to go? Actually, I'll go first since I've probably read the fewest new books out of the, a lot of us. Oh, I don't know. Uh, I might be able to give you give you a run for your money. Four. But... Sure. I've read four. I'm not even done with two of them. That's more than Fair enough. enough. Anyways, uh, so the ones I read, um. I read the two new Dresden Files books that came out this year, uh, Peace Talks and Battleground, and what a ride those were. Um, I, I can't really talk about them much because for fear of getting into... Yeah, no, those spoilers. are very, very spoiler-heavy books. They're very spoiler-heavy. Uh, they're very late into the series. They're books, I believe, 16 and 17. Of so the, they were of initially just supposed to be book 16, but Butcher realized that uh, it was too one book was, yeah, one book was not enough going to be like an epic fancy length book and uh that's not what jim butcher usually writes so not that he's bad at it he can certainly do it as the codex Alera approves but yeah it's uh... our codex Alera talk uh but regardless um they're very good books uh they can hit some really heavy stuff at points but i'm not going to go into any further detail for fear of spoilers um the other sequel book I have read, or rather am currently reading right now, is The Rhythm of War of the Stormlight Archive. That is also very spoiler-heavy, and it is uh, very long. I am over 800 pages in, and I still have over 300 pages left to read. I finished it day one. Yeah, but you're a freak of nature when it comes to speed reading, Fuzzy. Has it occurred to you that maybe everyone else is just uh, takes their time? In a healthy fashion? Yeah, I'm not the Flash when it comes to reading, so I don't read as fast as you. I do take my time, yes. I like to savor books. Consume and devour all things. But especially books. Now, now, Fuzzy, please control your inner Eldritch Abomination. No. <laughs> Honestly, I think, I think both approaches make sense, because, like, when you read quick it's just you get through the story it's you you get where you are and where things are going and it's just fun to be finished with a book soon i think because it minimizes the opportunity of getting yeah no and, that's that's my and, thing is and, that I... and books are one of the few pieces of media where i actually care about spoilers like i genuinely yes, don't care that about is spoilers kind of one of those... most things but with a, with a book that's the story is all you have like the story is what you experience so of, I think uh, there's there's merit to reading quickly, but there's also definitely something to taking your time and actually taking this stuff in because I know when I read a book fast, I don't remember as much of it after. 
no, same. I, I feel like if I try to speed read it, I wind up skipping paragraphs at points. Yeah. I don't even actively skip. It just doesn't have time to it. Like, oh, no, I, I don't brain. actively just, skip. I just yeah. do it on accident. I just don't notice, like, wait, what happened? When was uh, this character sitting down? Oh, wait, uh, I missed the paragraph. Oh, yeah, absolutely. This this rereading moment when you're like, wait, what? how did we get here? And you go back yeah, to the um, paragraph and I'm like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> anyways, Rhythm War, War is very good so far. I am enjoying it. I will it. say... I will say it does improve the reread value, though. Absolutely, I'm a big rereader. Yeah, Ooh, no, I, rereading is fun. I read every single book I read. I tend to read it like over and over again. Yeah, yeah. I I try to reread every now and then, but, but I, I think that's also partially because I just really dislike new things and hate change. <laughs> definitely, definitely, change is inherently bad. Always. Uh, <laughs> Sound like a couple of fossils. <laughs> Uh, anyways, um, uh, uh, as I was saying, uh, Rhythm of War is good. Um, if you're a fan of Stormlight and you're a fan of Sanderson, definitely a good, uh, good read. Uh, I, I would not necessarily say, agree with that assessment, but uh, I will let your you... Your opinion read. is different from mine, partially because you have completed it and partially because... Yeah, no, no, I'm just... I want to... Yes, that, that's fair. So I have some. Anyway, that's for later. Uh, I'm We're gonna, gonna have a rhythm of war spoiler talk in a yeah, few yeah. months. Yeah. So uh, I, I will actually, uh, Jack is. Uh, I'm I not done. Was... I... Yeah, yeah. There was one more, right? Yeah, I'm not done with the other book either. I was uh, trying to read it, but other books came out as uh, I was uh, reading it, and uh, those took priority, and I kind of lost track of time with that book. Uh, it's uh, Axiom's End by Lindsay Ellis. Uh, what I've read so far is very good. It's a very interesting book. Uh, it's a sci-fi conspiracy thriller from what yeah, I've I'll read. Yeah, so I'll definitely talk about that because I read that too. Excellent. Uh, I am not all that far in yet, but once I'm done with Rhythm of War, I'll probably try to finish that one. That's actually it's one I'm, book so far. I, might, I'm, I may give it a try. I generally find that sci-fi isn't really my thing unless it's sci-fantasy. Like, yeah, but it's also Lindsay Ellis. I uh, remind me what Lin Lindsay Ellis has done. She's uh, um, you video, oh, video essays. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I don't she's think I've her, so I don't. I don't really have the context to already know what she's about as well. So, yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that book. Like, should okay, I do it yeah. now or should I do it when it's my turn? I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, we should go around the. I think you guys uh, take the so. Full disclosure, I actually need to uh, consult my Kindle history because I believe I've read something in the neighborhood of 90-ish books thus far this year. Holy fucking shit, Holy shit man. <laughs> Look, I told you I read fast and I read a lot. Uh, granted, some of those were rereads, but like, I believe... I I'm are we getting... counting light novels here, too, or are we just doing regular novels? I don't think I've... Uh, no, that's not counting the web novels I read. No, light novels, not web novels. Yeah, no, that's not counting either of those. No, but are we counting them in this podcast? Yes, we are. Yes, yes. Okay, in that case, I did read a couple more books then. You can go um, ahead then. One of books them are was... books. Like, as long as it's words that tell a story, we're talking about it today. Okay, literature. I, I, I might the want to challenge that because I may have a comic book I want to talk about. But oh, that look, comic <laughs> books use words to tell stories. Just that's because true. they have pictures too doesn't mean they're not books. That's true. That's true. Well, we'll talk about graphic novels too. Uh, though I will say that we should probably leave off manga for a later time because we, we do, do have, have a podcast yeah, dedicated. Manga there, I'm saying definitely. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I read a graphic novel called uh, Road Queen, which was uh, basically a. Um, uh, it was basically a uh, lesbian romance, uh, which was a very good one, and I enjoyed it quite a bit. Uh, I think it came out, uh, it was released earlier this year, I think. Pretty sure. 90% sure. Oh! But it uh... was... And uh, the other one was also, uh, also a Yuri romance um, that has been plugged on the channel constantly on our Discord constantly. It was a uh, I favor the villainess or I am in love with the villainess was the um US. Ah, you read the novels of those then. Yeah, it's pretty good. 
pretty good. Yeah, um, it is. I've I've read the first one, so we can actually talk about that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a very good one. Uh, I do appreciate that it's not um, it's not like super um, what's the word? It doesn't it go very easy fast, on anything. Yeah. yeah, definitely, definitely. It, it it's not like a, the... an instant romance type thing. It's not like yeah, a, absolutely. It's not like, oh, just because this character got transported to another world, everything's easy. No, it's not. It's like her no one did, the it, person it also, she's in love with is like actively resistant to her because yeah. she kinda hates her guts. And it also doesn't do that thing where like I mean, at this point, just because of what's in the general internet and what you what I know about it, I I know they get together, but like at the end of this book, I would not have been surprised. I've only read the first one. I would not have been surprised to find out. No, it actually doesn't work out. Like it, it goes somewhere else because yeah, because it doesn't take the the short route anime often likes to take, which is yeah. Well, these two are obviously going to get together. It's more like oh, these two are going to get together, but I they, mean, they have their shit to sort there's, out. There's okay, a lot well, more okay, I, I, so I'm gonna have that. to like like stop you there. That's not very common in anime. It's like a lot of will they won't they for like uh four hundred. Yeah, but it's but it's yeah. but it's very shallow will they won't they. It's will they won't they because that pet. It's not will they won't they because because Society. it's actually a question ah, of will they, they won't they. Okay, okay, that that makes more sense. If it and, weren't for my natural aversion to the genre, I would probably have already started reading it, but I don't know. It's just a genre that kind of I would of... say wait until more of the, the light novels have been released. Yeah, probably. yeah. Yeah, I and think that that's I'm gonna take a look. Yeah, no, I, I do have a couple minor issues, but they're minor and they're also spoilers, so I'm not gonna go into that. Yeah. I One thing you know I will say talking... I think I do, yeah. One thing I will say that I that I actually really like, just because it's again not something I have come across in a lot of Japanese media, is that the protagonist is very confidently gay. Like it's it's none of the but I'm oh, only in I love, love with her or or person. oh, but 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 but. What okay, is my, so it's not that they're just very good friends, like in every. No, no, no. Other it's, it's, no, no, no. In, in like the first or second chapter, she explicitly says, "Yeah, no, I don't like guys. I don't. I never cared for that." Okay. And she okay. says it, and, and and other characters say, "Okay, if that's your deal, then that's your deal. Cool." And that's good. Like that is. Yeah, no, there's not good. enough of that in Japanese media. Which no, I understand it, the cultural reasons for it. That doesn't make it sure. Valid. Like, yeah, yeah. But it's it's definitely good that this book is very very open about that, and it doesn't take the easy way of going like, no, it's only those two or something. No, she explicitly states, no, I'm a lesbian. I I like women, and I don't care for guys. Mm -hmm. Look at us, four guys talking about lesbian representation. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we do need to talk about that. At no, length. definitely. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, but I think we should get through our summaries first before we uh, get dragged onto that topic, uh, because uh, I think it's something we will talk about a lot. So, But yeah, good representation is good, especially when it's uh, an, a fairly well-done romance series, uh, series or novel. <sighs> so, uh... It, as it turns out, I was being a little, uh... Hyperbolic? Little... No, no, uh, the no. opposite. I was being, uh, giving yeah. it, uh, it was, uh... What it turns out, like? uh... 109 titles completed in 2020. Was a fucking lowball? Holy shit! 109 titles completed in 2020, which is up yeah. from 70 in 2019. I wish I had the time. Jesus H. Time. Christ, I wish I had that free time. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, you have to understand, it's not necessarily just a matter of free time, but more that I can read a 500-page book in, like, I can read multiple 500-page books a day, let's just say. Christ. Very fast. Yeah, so, there's a lot of things I can go through. Uh, I'm just gonna go through some of the things that I know are new. Uh, a Testament of Steel was one that was very, uh, was a pleasant surprise by Davis Ashura. Probably a pseudonym, but you know what? It's a cool name nonetheless. That's a dope-ass name. Yes, it is. But, uh, so, I'm not sure of his exact, uh, ethnicity, but basically, 
is it's basically a cultivation novel but set in a very uh strongly south asian world it goes into like the traditional hindu and Bo- buddhist uh reincarnation stuff and like uh the cultivation system is more rooted in things like chakras and things like that like actual chakras not the fake uh naruto weeb kind um so more like yeah that's a very last airbender type chakras yes yes it is explicitly the same chakras uh because those are just rooted in uh hindu and buddhist philosophy did he have a, there's uh, all did the main character have a cool uh indian mentor dude who uh ha- who likes drinking uh Onion and banana juice. juice, man. You need onion yeah. and banana juice. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't count. Uh, so it's a very, it's actually kind of interesting because it fuses East and West. Interesting. Because it's a strongly, um, like, it's South Asian. Like, especially the human, humans are almost all South, A- there's mostly South Asians, but there's also a few Nordic and uh, European inspired human uh, civilizations. But they also have a traditional elves and dwarves and ants and things. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a very interesting fusion of East and West. And basically the setting is that uh, Everyone but humans can use magic naturally. Humans can, like, maybe pull it off in times of great distress, but not, like, intentionally. Except for our main character, for complicated reasons. Because, of course, like, that's just par for the course. And he has to go, and he has to deal with uh, anti-human discrimination, uh, because he goes to a school for elves. Oh, boy. The elves are very elvish, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Can't argue with elves. As in they're st- yeah, they're stuck up, bigoted, and convinced of their own superiority. They sound like lovely you know, people. Yeah. Also, uh, he wants to... Uh, he and uh, the elf princess want to bang, but okay. like they're not gonna because cultural reasons and things. It's like it's a whole thing. It's a very good book. I would recommend it. Though I will warn you, you may be confused because while it is attempting to be a standalone book, it is actually the third in a Cosmere esque interconnected universe. It's the third series. It's the first book of the third series in the author's universe. Okay, on a scale from. The, Elantris to uh to Stormlight, how continuity heavy is it? It's basically all of the continuity things are not really necessary, right? To the story. They're more like fun bonuses. Okay, so, so I would so say I put it around Mistborn. Mistborn, okay. Mistborn, yeah. We'll put it at around maybe mi- between the levels of era one and era two, Mistborn. Okay. So, like, you've got your hoids and things, and you've got your hints at a wider universe. But you don't, none of the previous series seem to be required reading. I would recommend trying the other series, though, because it, it's a very, he's he's got a very interesting uh, take on this uh, magic system stuff. I love good magic system. Mm-hmm. So, that's a good one. Uh, obviously, there's the uh, things like Rhythm of War. Uh, I read the newest in the Mage Errant series, which is kind of a whole thing. I read a very interesting uh, series, though only one of them was released recently this year. The Magician's Brother series, which is kind of just a... It's an experience, let's just say. Um, There's another... There's a new fantasy series I've been reading by James E. Wisher, all of... Three of the current four books are uh, have been released this year, and the fourth one is due this year. Uh, the I forget what it's called, uh, but it's by James E. Wisher. It's his new fantasy series. Uh, there's another series as well called the uh, Catalyst series, which is about uh, a group of uh, basically a world where certain people are 
known as uh, are basically put on a farm because they have components in their blood that allow uh, the nobility to make like basically immortality elixirs and they're basically human livestock. But it turns out oh, that the, the reason that they can do that is because they they're actually the world's mages. But there was a like a rebellion and a war long ago, so the actual power, so the actual abilities were lost until the main character meets an enigmatic mentor who points him in the right direction. Uh, I love enigmatic mentor characters. There's also a series that uh, is a German series that is apparently fairly beloved and has only recently started uh, being translated into English. The Thirteenth Paladin series. I have Lord, never heard he... of that. <laughs> Hang on. Well, apparently, it's a fairly well popular series from Germany, but it's only recently been translated to English. But it's it's very bog standard fantasy. But it's like so. I think the the main theme I've been seeing this year is aside from some things like uh, Testament of Steel, has mostly been just the bog standard fantasy executed reasonably well. And I think that's an important thing to remember is, like, there's nothing original. You don't have to, and not everything you write has to be a subversion. Sometimes if you just do the tropes and if you just do the Tolkien stuff, but you, like, execute it well, that's enough. Yeah, so definitely, the, I think. Basically the same relationship that uh, recent successes like Jujutsu Kaisen and uh, My Hero Academia with the mm -hmm. Yeah, that's strategy. exactly what it is. I've also, I also read a really depressing series called The Nothing Mage, which is a very closed-off standalone trilogy. What I mean by that is that it's an entirely character... So the world is entirely new, the magic system is pretty interesting, uh, but what's interesting is that... Uh, it's entirely focused around the title character, and I don't even know if there's any going to be any more in this world, but basically you don't really see much of the world. You just see it, the journey the title character takes, and it's kind of like horribly depressing. And then just, I regret reading that series, but it's, <laughs> you know. Uh, right, the yes. Portal War saga by James E. Wisher. That's, that's the oh. one I was thinking of. Hello? My, have well, I not no, been? I can still hear you. I don't know. I can hear you fine. So yeah, there's a lot of that. There's also some books that I'm not very proud of, but uh, I read them because I literally had nothing better to read. Uh, a lot of uh, lit RPGs and uh, just because you need to read the other side of things as well. You need to you gotta read, read the, the scroll to uh, appreciate the good grog. Mm hmm. Uh, a lot of cultivation novels as well, and I've rapidly come to the conclusion that I really shouldn't have read Cradle first because it's really good and it spoiled the rest for me. <laughs> but yeah, I think if I continue listing the new books I've read this year, we'll it'll probably the entire two hours will be taken up by me. So I'm just gonna give you guys the floor. Yeah. Uh, I wanna I wanna go back. I wanna go back to one thing you said. Um that there's definitely something to a more or less standard book, standard story pulled off well, because I think it's very often you see someone attempt that and just not do it, and that's most books, actually. And, and very often you see someone try to be subversive in some way and not really nail it because that's all they have. All they have is the subversion without actually saying anything. And... And none of these are good. Like, both of those are just books you read and forget. And I think there's definitely something to a narrative you've read 500 times just done very, very well. Yeah, I also like to add that uh, in a similar vein, a lot of the time, there's authors that actually do present something fresh that you don't really see very often. It's just that... Uh, the idea is there, it's just that it may have been a bit too ambitious for them to pull off, or they just weren't able to pull it off properly, because they don't have as much of a foundation. Yeah. Or they don't have the writing skills required. Yeah, definitely. But but I feel in those cases you at least usually end up with something interesting. Yes! And interesting is definitely 
or not definitely, but can be more important than good. Like if a book is interesting, I'm going to remember it. If a book is not interesting and not good, I'm just going to forget I read it. Because... You're going to remember The Room a lot more than you're going to remember a standard uh, the I, average. And then you're going to remember that movie. that movie if it had been a good movie or if it had been a competently made movie. Because Yes. And yeah. I think uh, another thing is uh, it's important to kind of bear in mind is that sometimes, even when all of the stars align, if the core idea, even if it's just because it's new, doesn't necessarily mean that the core idea is a good idea. Oh, oh no, God, definitely. Yeah. I've, I've seen train wrecks. I, there, there's like there's something to be said for like seeing something that's truly unique that you've never seen before and loathing it so much that anything that follows in its footsteps oh, is yes. just like... Yeah. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but, but getting maybe getting back to actual stuff we read. Um, new stuff I've read is... Let's talk about Axiom's End a little bit. I'm obviously not going to spoil it if you're still reading it, but I think it is definitely a book that merits discussion because it's it's one of those, the more you talk about it, the less interesting it sounds because it's like, yes, it's a science fiction story where aliens appear on Earth and don't really invade it, but whatever. Yeah, I've seen that. I've read that. And it's a story about a, about a girl who doesn't really have like strong family ties and her dad is gone and and she connects with this alien and like we've seen that before those are not necessarily interesting things but none of these are actually what the book's about like because the book is more about how two societies collide because these and that sorry to interrupt that good that's something that seems very very relevant in the modern oh day oh definitely it's 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 definitely relevant it's so relevant <laughs> Like it's it's not set in now, it's set in the early 2000s. And the reason for that, according to Lindsay Ellis herself, is more or less that it's a time she remembers well enough without having to react to actual current events. So it makes sense. Um, and yeah, as I said, it's more about how these two societies interact because the alien is quite literally alien. It It doesn't think in human patterns. It doesn't... Human society doesn't make sense to this creature, and at the I same time, admit, it's not something that it's something that's pretty hard to pull off. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it's done very, very well here, and actually, in another book I'm going to talk about later. But anyway, um, but that's that's like the point. The the these two creatures from two societies that do not work together because they have completely different moral and logical makeups, and how these two people the alien creature and the girl from Earth uh, have to interact and have to both grow into different people just to actually be able to understand each other. It's very, very interesting to read. And it's done very well. It does sound like it. Uh, what, what would you say is like uh, the most eye-catching thing that you would tell someone who like if you had to sell the book to someone like you want to convince them to read it which is i'm gonna be real giving people book recommendations is probably one of the most frustrating experiences right, for a lot of people because <laughs> oh god it, it, the thing is like people are very selective when it comes to their their book choices because books oh. are probably the most time consuming form of media besides that is true i will say you know even even beyond that even when and like, uh, please don't take this as a dig at you, Jack, because it's not meant to be. But uh, even because, uh, like, with the cradle situation, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So even when you th are fairly certain that uh, a person you know whose tastes you know fairly well, even when you're certain that they're going to like the like the media that you're presenting. That might not necessarily like translate when you're trying to give that recommendation, right? Yeah. Well, it doesn't help when you're with books. super, super pushy about it. I mean, that never yes. helps. But I think, especially with books, the thing is, a book is an is probably the most personal piece of media you can consume, like, mm. because because my version of of any book, like my version of Axiom's End in the end is going to be a different version than, than your version, just because 
how you interpret the text. And no, I, I don't even mean like philosophically what does the author want to say, just because the sentence, the walls in the room are blue, conjure different images for you and for me. Yes, it's just yes, how like, it works. And, books and, are also like the most, um, they require the most input from you out of anything Yeah, else. exactly, exactly. Because you, you, most, need your your you need to put your imagination, you need to put your imagination into it when you read a book. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of those things where it's, I can, I don't agree with a lot of the people who say that reading is boring. Like, I think that's just a oh, just no, that's not a good argument. take. But I think I can understand why people can think that. It's because they just are not willing to invest the amount of uh, time and mental time and overhead yeah, absolutely. necessary absolutely. to actually, like... Because uh, so much of enjoyment from reading is down to you, right? It's absolutely you have to kind of. I, I don't want to say you have to work for it because that kind of defeats the, the point, and that's not what I'm trying to say at all. But what I'm saying is that it's not unlike many other uh, forms of media. It's not one where you can just turn your brain off and just like yeah, absorb definitely. it. Passively, quite, right? quite the opposite. Like you have yeah, to. It, Actively like so engage many... with a book. You can't just turn and a I movie like... on and have it happen. You have to engage with the book you're reading. Also, yep. I feel like a complete boomer for saying this. <laughs> but I feel like people nowadays are a lot more into the idea of multitasking. Like having something on in the background and like... You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. I, I feel you. Like that's like having something on in the background while they're doing something else and like that's just not something you can do with books people do that to a certain extent with audiobooks and i yep. can i can honestly say i don't necessarily uh agree with that uh interpretation of things because like even in an audio if you're like just not paying that much attention to the audio and like just letting the audiobook happen miss so much like i know there's people who swear by audiobooks but that's like really the thing with audiobooks is that you can I, actually I... leave them on the background while you're like doing exercise or if you're uh driving or if you're driving, on a long yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah no that, that that's certainly it but i i've met a lot of people who like for example while they're doing like work or assignments or like something like that and it's just you can never do i don't think i can like task at once yeah, yeah, and that's the thing, is that, like, this is something they teach you in every introductory uh, psychology class. The human brain is not built for multitasking. Multitasking is We're not just an literally... thing. No, multitasking does not exist, yeah. Yes, it is. It's, just... it's literally not something that we can do physically. Yeah. Like, we just don't have the hardware. It's not a software no. issue, it's a hardware the issue. brain mm -hmm. does not allow for that. Yeah, <clears throat> and... But the, but the thing is, modern society has kind of made... This like both romanticized the idea of multitasking and made it so that people are like incentivized to constantly multitask. Because like, let's be real. Uh, at least again, I'm saying this. There's a this is a first world problems thing for sure. I'm Absolutely. definitely saying this from a position of privilege. But there's just a lot to do in like. Yeah when you're living in the first world, like there's just a lot of things that take up mental overhead that you just have to do. And like it, if you can't do more than one thing at once, it just means you don't have the time to do things that you might like want to do. And for a lot of people, that's just like, there's no easy way to reconcile that. So they just uh, try and like oftentimes fail to just multitask everything. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's really not something that works particularly well if you're not, like... If one of the tasks has to be something that is of secondary focus to you, which means that basically you are not doing it, you're not dedicating a lot of attention to it. Like, if you're just, like, mindlessly playing a, a mobile game, or if you're, um, say, cooking something that doesn't require... You're just cooking something in the microwave, that's not going to require a lot of effort. Yeah, right? or if, for example, you are on a podcast while uh, playing Hades in the background because it's just muscle memory at this point. Wow. <laughs> Look, Rude. I'm 
I have offered I have nothing to offer in my own defense except I'm literally not paying attention to the game at all. <laughs> so yeah, but that, anyway. I was back to books. Yeah. If I if I had to sell if I had to sell that's just podcasts. If I had to sell Axiom's end to people, I would say the most interesting about thing about it, and this is such a person who reads book thing to say is actually the relationship between between the two main characters because of how different they are. And that requires compromise of both of them. And I think it is worth it to see where they can and also where they cannot compromise because at this point we live in a society and compromise is not really a thing anymore. Like people don't really like compromising because compromise feels like losing to everyone. And which is and the mark it, of a good compromise. The mark of a good compromise. Absolutely. No, no one is unhappy. No one's happy. Yeah. But, no one but, is this, happy with but this book is very much about how they 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 have to compromise. They literally would not survive if they didn't. And and how out of these compromises where both of both of them more or less just roll with the punches because they have to grow a genuine friendship. Relation. I don't know. I don't think at the end of the first book we're ready to classify what their relationship actually is. So. Um, oh yeah, I was gonna ask. Uh, this is a question I must ask for our uh, for our uh, discerning twenty first century audience. Yes. There is no Do alien fighting in this book. Like no, not necessarily physically, but like on an emotional level. It's hard to say just because there is there is no boldly going apparently. No, no, there isn't. But but their relationship is very complicated, and I. If we were in spoilers, I would have some things to say, but I will not. Uh, is it a standalone reason. or is it going to be a series? No, no, the sequel is going to be out next year, I think. Okay, so what you're saying is there's a chance. There's definitely a chance. All right, that's all I needed to hear. And that sells. Um, anyway, so excellent, definitely recommendation for me. A very, very good book. Now for that comic book and for things I will butcher because the authors or artist, writer, whatever, is Croatian and his name is going to murder me. But the book is called Harleen and it's uh, by maybe uh, Stjepan Sage is, I think, his name. And he's known for stuff like uh, Sunstone, which is a very not safe for work, but very, very good lesbian romance book. Um, and Harleen is his take on Harley Quinn. On the I was going to say, Harleen, Harleen sounds familiar. Is it about Harley Quinn? Yes, it is. And it's it's a very interesting read because the approach he takes is that she was a, a, a trained professional before and she knows about mental deterior deterioration and she sees hers. She just can't stop it. Oh, that is just like... I will say uh, that is an approach that's been taken with Harley Quinn before. Oh, definitely, uh, but... But it's, I, I think it's, it, but as we've uh, talked about, it's a matter of, it's not whether or not it's been done before, it's a matter of the execution. And, uh, yeah. and, and, get, and like, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's just a very well done one. I think I can technically spoil this one just because. It, it, we all, we, it's, it's, it's if, if you are interested in the origin story of Harley Quinn, you know the origin story of Harley Quinn. And it just, it, it takes its time. It's three issues. Um, and it's, it's very much about how she, keeps rationalizing what's happening while also realizing that she is just rationalizing and that she's basically gone by the end. And yeah, it's, it's, it's just uh, a very interesting read with amazing artwork. That guy is great. Yeah, so I will say that is one of the most real fears I think anyone can ever experience because it's it's a it's in the same flavor of adult fear as something like Alzheimer's or dementia. Oh god, yeah, please just... shoot me if I ever get Alzheimer's. Yeah, no shit. Like, where you just see your mind go and you can't do it. Yeah, anymore. yeah, because, like, that is That's actually how it horrifying happens. horrifying on an existential level. That actually happened with Terry Pratchett, who, phenomenal author, probably, I would say, he, hands down, if not the best, then certainly my favorite author of the uh, 20th century. Uh, he definitely knew, because he had early onset Alzheimer's and he got mm -hmm. diagnosed very early, but he kept writing basically until the end, but you could tell, and as a result, you could very clearly see that he was making conscious like decisions and corrections that he would not have otherwise. But it's just, it's, 
it's so real and that's really the thing is that um effective fiction because we're talking mainly about fiction let's be real here yeah definitely like, there's an argument to be made for nonfiction, but i have never really appreciated nonfiction that much it's probably a failing of mine but i just, just it just does not connect with me but the thing about fiction is that it is the mark of a good story is how much you can feel and relate with the characters regardless of the subject matter so i have read like a story about glorbulons from omicron 5 can f connect with you more on an emotional level than a story about like your next door neighbor absolutely and that's that's what that's makes fun. harleen work, work very well because we are kind yes. of we're kind yes. of used to superhero or supervillain origin stories being like and then this exceptional person had this exceptional thing happen to them and now they're a superhero. And and that's very, very explicitly not what the book is. The book is very much this just happened to her. Like this is this is a thing and that just happened to her and now she's where she is. So but. I think there's there's actually a similar thing. Uh part of Tom King's run of uh Batman Rebirth, which is the oh, yeah. DC imprint. So he had a run in which there was an arc titled I Am Suicide. And in it was a Batman versus Bane arc, but in between, in every chapter, there was an ongoing series of letters that Batman and Catwoman wrote to each other while she was uh, locked up in Arkham. And essentially, what it came down to was them just very in a very realistic and human manner opening up to each other about their trauma and their own acknowledgement of mental illness which is not which is something not enough batman authors do because batman is inherently an extremely mentally broken yeah, character batman's brain oh no is he fun. has so much ptsd he's and literally a 9 year old still like yes just and like uh, out of the batman and the joker i'm pretty sure the joker has a much uh, better grasp of reality and has a more sane <laughs> demeanor i'm not i'm not sure it go that far but no definitely like many people are not really ready to treat batman like a person with deep mental issues and he and yeah and that right. was what that entire arc was about and essentially it culminated in this idea that, and this is spoilers for the arc, but the arc was like four years ago. Yeah. This, it culminated in basically both Batman and Catwoman saying that the reason they go uh, through their lifestyles the way they do and the reason they go up against like these beings of incredible power with nothing but their frail human bodies is because at their core... They are deeply, deeply, like, they don't have a will to live anymore. And so, basically, their respective crusades, Catwoman with her robbery of the powerful and Batman with his crusade against uh, the supervillains, is just their way of basically just trying to die without actively doing the deed or just yeah. letting it happen. And they're they're was... trying to find a good way to die, basically. Yes, yeah, they're without, looking without, their own... without trying to bog us down in Batman talk. There's a two-issue Batman story by uh, Neil Gaiman. So uh, talking about uh, Terry uh, Pratchett. Whatever, happened, uh, to the whatever happened to the Cape Crusader? And mm, I love that. Very is, good. Yeah, that's like that's such a great story where it's like what you get for being Batman is at some point you die. If it's a good death, you die helping people, but at some point you die. And what you get for that is nine years with your parents, and then you become Batman again. <laughs> and that's just that's such an interesting take on on why Batman even exists. That's I love that. It's probably one of the books I read. I every fucking love Neil Gaiman. He's such a good author. Yeah, like great. it's there's a question often asked, uh, and I, again, Batman is just a very fascinating character. So I continue absolutely I like talking about him. There's I a question often asked. Of course. Yes, uh, we actually should have a Batman podcast. Do you want to be on sure, that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we should have Gen on that because he would actually prov provide a divergent opinion because he's really not into Batman. Mm. So, I'm but yeah, about but, but I was going to say is anyway. very often is like there's no shortage of ways in the DC universe for someone as like 
intelligent and with as many resources as Batman to gain phenomenal cosmic powers and become yeah. godlike. Like, he's turned down Green Lantern rings more times than I can count. <laughs> they gave him one in Elseworld once. That was stupid. <laughs> yeah, no, no. He, oh, yeah, literally... no, Batman was... No, with Just, that yeah, Tom broken. King arc really crystallizes the reason is he doesn't want that advantage because no. it just means he just won't like he'll be that much less likely to die a uh, death which is completely going against him because like let's be real in every version where Batman gains superpowers mm. he has to lose them otherwise he just if he is the one of the single most effective individuals in the universe without any superpowers you give him superpowers and it's basically just over yeah the story no longer have any tension but even in world the reason he doesn't want it is because at his core he's kind of a selfish person he's not doing this like obviously he wants to help people i'm not saying he's a bad person but no, no. at his core he wants to die we we should definitely have a batman talk at some point does- <laughs> Let's, yes. uh, let's get Batman. off Batman. But anyway, um... oh, let's, not, let's not get off Batman. I, uh, that's for a separate. For, that's for the horny episode. God but let's get it, off fuzzy. The top. God fucking. What? Let's see what we do. Walk right into that. Um, you you walked yourself in. But... Hey, you, you got to work for your own goals sometimes. Um, <sighs> one more book I want to talk about is. Harrow the Ninth, which is actually the sequel to Gideon the Ninth. Uh, Locked Tomb Trilogy, two books are out. Next one is, I think, out 2022, which is terrible. Because I don't want to wait that long. Um, so uh, it's a sequel, so it's kind of hard to talk about. The thing I want to say is, the not tagline, but like one of the most famous review text lines uh, from the first book was... Blurbit. Yeah, pretty much. Was uh, lesbian necromancers explore a gothic palace in space. And the two things to say about that is, one, it sells the book very, very short because there's much more going on in that. The world building is frankly stunning. I've rarely seen world building that amazing. uh, Into that series, I just... But the second thing to say about that blurb is it tells you everything you need to know. Like, if that blurb makes you... Say yeah, I think I want to read that. You should definitely do it. If and if you say no, I I don't care, then you probably actually won't care. But I will say, thanks to the second book, both uh, both the main characters Gideon and Harrow are probably two of my favorite characters. So I was actually gonna I was actually gonna bring something up. One of the things that's made me leery about this is that. I've I've obviously sought out reviews because that's kind of what you yeah. do when you're a bit uh, undecided on a series. One of the things that's made me a bit leery is that apparently the the relationship between two of the mains is kind of toxic and yeah, that's it doesn't also really hesitant. It doesn't seem to like take too many uh, steps to address that. What as someone who's read both books currently out, how would you comment on that? Uh, without getting into spoilers. I mean, it 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 doesn't take steps in in that there is not really the point where they like talk all their issues out. Quite that just doesn't happen because they they are not in a position to do that. There's just there's just no time for them to tackle that. Like they they get to a point where they say, yeah, we if we need to work together or or actually want to get together as people or whatever, we we kind of need to work on all this shit. But they just don't get to it like there's there's too much story happening around them and the second book actually does quite a few very interesting things with with their relationship which i can't really get into because it would basically spoil the entire first book okay uh, so, but, so what you're telling me it's, 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 not... it's not it's not like the book is tone deaf the book is very aware of what's going on and where the issues lie it hasn't really gotten around to addressing them yet that's so, okay, so like, it's as, long as, it, as long as just I want to establish it doesn't fetishize it. No, not really. I I, I wouldn't say so. Okay, that's good. That's, that that's is honestly good. that yeah. I can I can uh, live with that. Uh, like it didn't feel like that to me, and I think I have talked to people who might have seen that otherwise, but it didn't feel like that to me. That's all I can say. What I'm very interested in is to see if if and how people talk about this book in like 10 to 15 years because ah, 
I particu- see. Particularly, not, I don't think like they won't age well or whatever, or at least not because of that. The thing is, Gideon basically talks like she was raised on Twitter. Oh, but like not in a uh-huh. terrible like it's it's not it's not oh fuck it's all memes it's not like that like it's not terrible and cringy or anything it's just she talks like people today talk and, ah so she's much more uh, in t- in line with um modern speech patterns she's yeah zo- like she's so she's a zoomer is what you're saying not only not only not only that with speech patterns like she she keeps talking about how how hot she is and and how badass she is and stuff and she actually is both of these things but it's just like she's she's self-aware but not in a like not in a avengers this is written so the person is self-aware kind but just in the way people today are actually often self-aware and i'm very interested and it also like literally references some memes that are just memes today. And I'm very interested how these things. Work. Yeah, and that's always. If, that's it, if, always it, good. if it will be one of these book series where people say it's very good and it's of its time, like that's I can totally see people saying that about these Would books in like say that fifteen to twenty years. The series is pogged out of its gourd. I'm not familiar with that phrase. <laughs> uh, it's fine. That's. You may be better a better person for not being familiar with that phase, phrase phrase because uh, not very poggers with you, fuzzy. Remember, I am an old man. I don't know things. Um, anyway, like it's not it's not an intrusive way. Like it it doesn't feel like maybe that's the best thing to say. It doesn't feel like like a fifty year old person who saw Twitter and went like, oh, kids like their memes today. Wrote it. It just sounds like <laughs> someone who is. Like in their mid twenties, maybe early thirties, wrote this the way they would write a thing, and I do wonder how that will feel in like, as I said, fifteen, maybe yeah. ten, maybe twenty years, it may, maybe even sooner than that, considering how fast. Uh, yeah. Things like at, one, at, at, at one point, at one point, it, it, it references all. lose yourself and mom spaghetti and shit. Like I, I don't know how these things will age. I can only say. That it is in the moment it happens in the book is fucking hilarious. Like it's incredibly funny, but I don't know how these things age because you can't know that. Yeah, Fair enough. Fair but enough. even even besides that, the books are amazing. The world building is great. I've, as I said, I've rarely seen world building done this well, and it's just it does that thing where it never tells you it's world building. It just does it, and like two pages later, you realize, hey, I've just learned tons of things about the setting without even realizing it. Interesting. Which is uh, much easier said than done, believe me. Definitely. As a, definitely. As a burgeoning author who has only recently realized how bad I am at writing, it's a lot easier said than done. And don't get me wrong, like exposition is not always bad, and there's definitely exposition dumps in this book, but a lot of it feels very organic, and that's always appreciated. That is a positive. So that's as I said. the The tagline is a short selling the book, and b if you read that tagline and say, "Yeah, I can deal with that," then you're probably going to enjoy this book. If you don't, you probably won't. Huh. Not everything can be for everyone. But it does seem like a it's a series that is worth getting into, and I think I'm finally gonna like. Actually, you know what? I might wait for the third book in the series to be out. Since might if I actually wait... want to do that because. Yeah, I honestly don't know what the fuck happened at the ending of the second one. Ah. Oh boy, oh. this was, was amazing because I was reading the second one and I was like, going, "Holy shit, this is like at eleven the whole time." And then the ending escalation oh. happened. And, oh no, actually we were like at three the whole time, and now we're at eleven. Oh, so my. it was up to eleven, and then it broke off the dial. Pretty That's much, funny. yeah. Uh, I mean, fucking... I, don't get me wrong. As someone whose favorite series right now probably is the Cradle series by Will White. Uh, Lore, have you read that? Am I going to have, have not, but you can't I... spoil it because I probably won't because, like, as far as I know, it's a lot of books by now. And well, I am reading it, and I, I am I going to it's, 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 it's like, I will say that there is a lot of books. There's eight books out right now, but it's very much light novels. Every single book yeah. is like 200, 250 plus pages. Okay. I might, no, I don't know. I might get into that. I, might, I, don't, I don't know. I, I do think that it, it, I, it's one of those, it's a interesting story well told i i would recommend it to anyone and also it is very much 
good about that being turned up to 11 the whole time and then you realize oh no the the real sandra lanch was not even there yeah that, it was that, inside that's... you all along friends you met along the way anyways uh why don't we talk about the old books we read yes, now that well, we uh ah uh, fuck uh yeah we should probably talk about it. wow we've already been to i mean i guess that's just a sign of a good topic is we've been talking for an hour on le- already and i did not had not even noticed at all well part of the Even reason enough. is because we got sidetracked by tangents a bit too so. yeah but that's just podcasts i don't think there's a podcast on earth that can say it doesn't get sidetracked by tangents if it doesn't it's God, it's damn right but yeah anyways uh, I might as well go first again. Sure. Since... Okay. Um. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Uh. So speaking of Cradle, I did read the first book of that series. Um. It's a pretty good introduction to the series, but it reads very much like a prologue. It's probably my biggest and only significant criticism. Uh. Like, it does a good job of introducing the magic system, introducing the the two leads, and uh introducing the world to uh to re to readers but at the same time like again it feels very much like this is the prologue to something much bigger and uh, i will say uh because these are smaller novels it a lot of people actually do say that it's uh one of those things where you might consider the first three books to be uh one one epic fantasy book right so this is basically Act One of the it's first. Act one. It's first Act book. One of a. If you consider the first three books to be an epic fantasy trilogy, it's Act One of a three-act book. Yes. Okay, so this is. So I just need to move on to Act Two, Electric Boogaloo, and things yes, will get flowing. Yes. Uh, really, the second book is where it really comes into its own, and there's actually a very interesting in-world reason for that as well. Which. Uh, well, I, I guess I'll find that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, uh, I read that. Good book. Interesting, interesting premise and all. And uh, I look forward to reading more, but I have to finish the fucking Sanderson tome I have been slogging through first. Uh, by slogging through, do you mean it's legitimately just been a slog, or is it just no? Because it's just it's so fucking long. Yeah, no. I mean, it's kind of a good thing these only come out once a every three once, years. Yeah, once every three or four years, huh? I don't think yeah. people can handle much more of that, and I'm pretty sure Sanderson oh, God, would just, no. just be a vegetable before he hit 50 if he had to write more than one of these every three years. He said as much. Honestly, I have the hardcover, and I could use that as a murder weapon. Yeah, but that's like really any of Sanderson's uh, bibliography. Yeah, but 1,200 pages is a lot. That is true. It is probably the longest book I've ever read. But anyways, I did take a look at a couple other books that are older this year. Um, I was in the middle... I'm also trying to finish um, the most recent Mistborn book, uh, Bands of Mourning. I have less than 100 pages left of that one. Uh, though That and Axiom's End are the two books I'm trying to finish right now. So those are on my list. Yeah, Bands of Mourning seems especially relevant since... Uh... That's apparently the sequel to that is going to be the next Osmere book. Oh, that's fun. Well, all yeah. more reason to finish it soon. But yeah, no, it's a good book. Um, I have less than 100 pages left, and uh, crazy shit has been happening, which is always a sign of a good Sanderson book. Usually a sign of is that I think uh, there's going to be several things in the... Bands of Mourning that are going to be very... Or, like, there's going to be several things in Bands of Mourning that are actually going to be fairly relevant in Rhythm of War and vice versa. Well, fuck me, I guess. Oh, well. Yeah, because that's just kind of one of those things that, uh... Sanders, that's that's kind of his whole thing, is he's not the first to do it, but he certainly popularized it in the modern day. Oh, yeah, no, he loves doing that shit. But regardless, uh... I did try to pick up one other book, but I just dropped it a hundred pages in because it just wasn't really capturing me. Um, I forget what it was called. I think it was uh, something. Daughters of the Storm was what it was. 
uh, had a very Norse um, Norse fantasy type feel to it so, with one of those old magic type systems where it's like mysterious and vague and not really well defined but like it just didn't really pull me in partially because none of the characters felt all that compelling and I wanted to like it too because it was one of those it actually had like the setup was interesting it had a five different female characters with very different personalities all uh, coming together but at the same time like they they all felt pretty uh uh pretty flat as characters they just like uh oh this one's the grumpy aggressive warrior one this one's the uh love struck one who is star crossed with her lover and so on and so forth and uh yeah, so I just didn't bother with finishing it. Which is unfortunate, but what you gonna do? Yeah, yeah that's just kind of how the chips fall sometimes. Uh, a literature prof- professor of mine always said, like, there's so many good books out there, I don't really have time to waste on ones that don't interest me. And that's, that's a, very, a uh... very healthy way to look at dropping a book, because, yeah, why read something you don't enjoy? Yeah, I've actually, so I will admit that has, that was actually my biggest problem in the past is just I could not bring myself to drop books or drop series, but I've definitely gotten much better about that as I yeah. made. Oh, so I was in my like mid-twenties, I could not drop a book. I had to finish everything. And then she said that and I was like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually. I, let's, I, let's maybe do that in the future. For me, it's just a time issue. Like... I don't have enough time in the day anymore. Like, I only read 109 books this year. I just don't have the time Shut to up. waste. <laughs> Look, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm obviously being partially facetious, but I am partially serious. There's no, just no, not I, I, I actually get what you mean, yeah. Just, you read an insane amount of books, but still, like, you don't want to waste time on books you, in the end, won't remember and won't yeah. care about. Like, uh, for example, there was actually one on the subject of both older and newer books. Uh, one series I was reading is called the Frith Arcanists series. It's a very interesting take on uh, magic because it's an entirely familiar-based magic system in that uh, you have to for- form a soul bond with a mystical creature, and uh, that soul bond is what informs your magic for the rest of your life, and you can only form one bond in your life, so... It's one of those books, and it's very, very interesting. Its biggest flaw is that the main character is like it's a the, the main character is just <laughs> like on a scale from it... one to ten, how wretched. So no, it's a very interesting world. I tried to stick it out because of the world, but it has an. Will they, won't they incest subplot straight out of oh, Japan? Jesus oh Christ. no! Fucking Why? hell! Well, no, it it does the whole thing, but uh, they're adopted siblings, so it's fine. Uh... So basically, the main character is an orphan who is brought up by a local gravekeeper and has various misadventures <laughs> uh, with his adopted sister, who is also brought up by the same gravekeeper and is just like I get it but not only does it do a, a will they won't they uh, apparently and this is spoilers for a series that I don't think anyone here is going to read I would not recommend wasting your time with it but apparently so they don't in the third book well, but something. instead what ends up happening is that she gets together with the brother's bully Oh, why? Dead. Fuck. Yeah, who Fuck is like a he's, he's the spoiled rich boy, arrogant young master character. Do, do people not have editors anymore? Just no, actually, I think that's one of the things that really is something that Kindle has been suffering Fucking from. Is that so many books? Yes, yeah, self-publishing. That's one of the biggest problems with self-publishing is that. People don't have editors because, like, editors are expensive. But listen, you took all this time to write these 400 pages of drivel. You should definitely publish them because... Yes, yes. Let me put uh, put together my um, not fanfic, uh, fully not fanfic. No, I changed all the names. I changed all the names. It's not fanfic anymore. (laughs) It's got both... And then in that very same book... Yeah. 
in that very same book, that character very, very obviously um, calls for a ploy that involves him thinking with the wrong head, if you know what I'm saying. Oh, God damn it. So yeah, that is just... At, at, I saw the writing on the wall. I saw that he was very obviously basically inviting an an obvious enemy to a secure location because he was attracted to her. Uh, and that was when I just said, you know what? I'm done. I don't care that there's like, apparently the book, the series gets a lot better after this point. I don't care. Like I, if it takes two and a half books to get, apparently yeah, it no. gets really good at the end of the third book. I don't care anymore. Yeah, but that, that's, 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 that's the shonen go. anime thing. Like it's very good after yeah. episode 137. Yeah, but then fuck it. <laughs> hey, <laughs> if it's sure that, anime is not that bad about it, it, right? If it takes that long to get good, you have yeah, a then, problem. Then it, then it just isn't good, period. Yes. Yeah. Just yeah, yeah, no, like there, there's a difference between starting off decent and then getting great, and starting off awful and then getting readable. Yeah, definitely. Like again, if it takes that long to get good or even readable, then it's just not good because yeah. So uh, I'm proud of myself for that one. That one is definitely one that in what's it called? So I know how to avoid it. It's the Frith. Frith Arcanist series. So I believe the first one is called Nightmare Arcanist, uh, and it goes from there. Yeah, I'm not touching that shit. <laughs> yeah, so it's just like I'm proud of myself for drawing. another book series I've read this this year that where uh, most of it was earlier, but part of it came out this year is the Magician's Brother series, which it's one of those series where. It has interesting and fairly unique ideas with its magic system and everything. And it's a very interesting take on urban fantasy, actually, because it's a world in which magic has existed forever. But because of an event that happened 15 years or like about 20 years before the start of the series, uh, the masquerade was broken. So it's an urban fantasy that takes place very soon after the post masquerade world. Ooh, that's fun. It's always a fun setting, yeah. So it's a very interesting setting. Uh, the thing is, the main character is a bit of a Mary Sue, or a Gary Stu, as it were. I just I just consider Mary Sue to be a gender-neutral term, honestly, so I don't really bother with uh, differentiating. But yeah, he's basically, everyone loves him, and he's more or less perfect. Uh, so that's not fun. The world is fairly interesting. Also, it's one of those things where... Um, I think the author is trying to be sex positive and like just uh, very uh, positive of things like polyamory and like uh, no strings attached uh, relationships and things like that. But I just think that he's just not, or he or she, I don't know, they're just not very good at it. So, oh. whereas is it the they whole, try... um, he's confused, but he's got spirit type thing. Yes, yes, he doesn't really know what he's talking about, but the like he has decent intentions. So again, don't people uh, do people just don't have editors anymore? Eh? Yeah, like, so have they someone read your fucking book. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? And I I feel like that's actually something that uh uh Rhythm of War has kind of suffered for. Uh for those of you not aware, Rhythm of War is the first Sanderson novel in which the longtime editor of the Cosmere is not the editor. Instead, the editor is the head of Tor's YA division. That explains things. Yeah, it explains a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, it's not too noticeable, but you can tell something. There's definitely some YA parts Elements, that definitely yeah. do not feel like proper Sanderson. Mm -hmm. Which is starting to make me believe that it's possible that part of the Sanderson magic was the editor. I mean, having a good editor is always important for good fiction. Yeah, and and I think a uh, big issue is uh, that the... Uh, we'll talk about this when we get to the... Uh, we we talk about it more. Yeah. But yeah, basically, the, the point I'm trying to make is that even when you do have an editor, if the editors are, like, people you know too much... Or, like, if you take too much of their feedback into account, that's just as bad as not taking feedback into account at all. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so this Magician like Brother series is... It's interesting enough, right? It's, like, it is not... 
objectionable <laughs> in, in like any way. But it just it's it tries and does not really pull off. I don't think it does what it wants to do. Does it do that thing Which, where the fifty year old is on Twitter for the first time and it's like, oh, that's what the youngins like today? <laughs> it just it writes does something a little they bit have like no that. connection to. Because you yes, can I don't actually that. know how old or no, the but, author but, is or anything. You can feel when that happens when just when an author yes, writes it has that energy. From a perspective they Strong just don't have. Twitter energy. Yeah. And uh yeah, so for example, it uh it does the thing where it tries to be sex positive, but what it ends up doing is it ends up overcompensating in, in the opposite direction and it makes it so that everyone is polyamorous, which is just like not reflective of reality not, yeah no. it'd be one it'd be one thing if that was like part of a, a, a fantasy built culture but it's another thing it yeah impose that on just reality yeah yeah so it's like yes polyamory is definitely a thing that exists and needs more attention but like it's not but when you have it so every single character in your book except the main character is like almost strictly polyamorous it kind of just like you're compensating too hard in the opposite direction, I think. Just say <laughs> strictly polyamorous is a very interesting combination of words. <laughs> you, you, right? <laughs> uh, and also, just also, apparently, every female character is into the main character, except like two. A fucking course. Have you heard of? Have you yeah, heard so of that? Anime? Also... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's just like. I feel Peter, like there is no the author harem anime in my literature. Look, Jack, you are the last person I'm gonna take that from. Uh, that's fair. That's fair. Of us all, you're probably you have the most. You like the most uh, trashy stuff. Yeah. Traditionally trashy. Yes, I, I do have some degenerative tastes. What uh, I will cop to that. Yeah, so yeah, basically it's a it's a harem it's a very harem esque, except everyone is banging everyone, is what it feels like a lot of the time. Yeah, that, and characters do have a tendency to uh that, that goes, think a little bit too much with the wrong head. That, that's even that's beyond what I'm even normally into. That that goes well beyond things. Uh well beyond my limits. Jesus. So yeah, uh it's an interesting series, and I think it has some very interesting, solid ideas. It's just like, you know, uh, it's not all there, right? It doesn't have everything it needs. Mm. But yeah, uh, what else have you guys, what what other older series have you guys read uh, this I uh, actually year? have not read a lot else, partially because I've been... Uh catching up on other things like um, TV series, anime, manga, stuff like that. But mm -hmm. I do have a list of things I do want to get into, foremost of which is was Dune, because I was expecting the movie <laughs> to come out this month. <sighs> movie I, have, I have reread Dune this year. I have reread it for the fifth or sixth time, I think. Like, I, I know the book. Um, it's still very, very good. It's also a book that is very hard to recommend just because it's it's a fucking beast of a novel. It's I mean Laps every, and Stormlight. You're, you're talking to the Sanderson guys, so I think We we read yeah, but, Fantasy but, for Breakfast. Yeah. And look, and Frank dinner. Herbert has a very, very, very yes, particular way of construction. Like of Yes, yes. It's a very uh it's much it's much denser, I think. Yeah. And uh, something like Stormlight. It's it's also a kind of a product of its time in the sense that not the in terms of yikes social views, but like rather in the sense that uh, there's a lot of techniques that authors have developed that help readability that are just not there with that book, right? Yeah, definitely. So, to make I was going to I, I was going to say not, word, not even that care. much in the sense of the social pros, views, pros. just because just because it completely chucks any social views we might hold completely out the window. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing is that... I mean, uh... The thing about Dune is, first of all, basically every single word in the story actually matters. Yes. And also, and... 
And also there's two appendices to the book that you actually need to read. Like they are not, you can't just, I mean, you can't skip them and not read them, but they, they explain why the story is the way it is. And if you haven't read, like that tells you everything. It's a, it's a giant book with seven all sequels. I, all and, I need to know yeah. is that the spice must fall, flow and he who controls the spice controls the universe. Yeah. And also something much. about um, giant ass sandworms. Y'all want to know something really hilarious? You what? want to know my uh, first experience with the Dune series was? Was it the movie? No. That was mine, what? actually. It was, and this is something that is incredibly obscure. There's a Dune RTS on the Sega Genesis. The fuck? Yeah, and that was my first experience with the series. Yeah, that was it's... actually made by Westwood, and it was the games they've made before they started working on original Command and & Conquer and Red Alert. Yeah, so... Uh, Dune 2 is great. Like, it's that's a unplayable sur- today, but it's great. It's a surprisingly fun game, even though yeah. it has the weakness of being an RTS, a.k.a. a game that really benefits from a mouse and keyboard on a three-button <laughs> well, controller. doesn't have either, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, but yeah, that's, they're good games, actually. It's a, a surprisingly fun game. Yeah. I believe it was Dune Battle for Arrakis. Yep. Is the full name. Yep. Uh, I played the Greenhouse. I forget their names now because they it, had. I I'm, I don't fully remember how the game allocated colors. I'm not sure the green were Atreides or if blue they were made... Atreides. Yeah, they, they oh. made a third house for the game that actually doesn't exist in those worlds. Oh, I may have played that one then, because that yeah, was I the one where... I think that was with the one that just was full aggro and just murder everything yeah. from the start. And that's, like, kind of my aesthetic when at yeah. that age. I was very young, by the way. So, like... No, I mean, the thing about Dune is, it's, as you said, it's incredibly dense. Like, every single thing that happens, A, matters, and B, is connected to everything else somehow how, and how characters the pros in it how's the pros very and one of its strongest suits like but also one of its greatest weaknesses depending yeah on it's, how like, you it's like it's like it's like it's like Tolkien on steroids like Tolkien is very wordy and frank herbert is also that but worse oh, boy. And, it's, and it's great because like basically said, imagine someone reads uh tolkien and his appendices and all that and is like <laughs> uh, that's the that's light. So that's light. That's just why yeah. I yeah, yeah. Would exactly. So like, Dune is not easy to read, but it's well worth the effort. It's a very, very, especially like in light of what it is, because by the time Dune was written, sci-fi like that did not exist. Yeah, it was really, it really uh, it's pre-Star it was Trek, essential... it's pre-Star Wars. It 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 made sci-fi have what it is today, definitely. Like, Dune is to sci-fi what uh, Tolkien was to epic fantasy. Yeah, kind of. And also, like that's... If you, if, you like, if you like Warhammer 40k and the lore, it's, Dune is also kind of that. Like, it's everything. Like, Dune is, Dune is everywhere. You, can't, you cannot open a science fiction narrative of any kind today and not have Dune in it. So, I, I think another important thing to bear in mind is that... Uh, you may, if reading Dune, suffer from the Seinfeld effect. Yeah. Yes. Where you just see things and say, that, I, I know that. Yeah, but it's the, the reason you know it is because yeah. Dune is where it yeah. came from. But that's Very just something like... a lot of people don't make yeah. the connection. And also, Dune is fucking weird. It is, isn't it's it? It's so fucking weird. Every single like, time I read it, it's so strange. Like... The thing, you can say whatever you want about the original Dune movie, but the fact that Sting in a thong and nothing else is probably one of the least, uh, most accurate things. Yeah, absolutely. Things. absolutely. Yeah. The fact, that should really tell you all you need to know. Yeah. Like it's yeah, so no, strange. Dune is something, something else. Yeah. And seen. also, I, I, I always like to tell the story. Uh, Dune obviously is not just one novel. It's a, it's a cycle of, I think, six or seven. Like By now, it's much more because uh, Frank Herbert's son and I don't know who... I was going to say, didn't Frank Herbert die like a couple decades ago? Yeah, yeah, but, but his, his, his son and, and, and someone else. Like someone, someone with a big name. I'd have to look it up. I don't care. Anyway, have written on, like, I think 
their uh, Dune book came out this year, and by now it's like fifteen or anything. But whatever. My 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 dad had a collection of the original six or seven. Died books. almost thirty five years ago. My yeah. God. My my dad had a collection of the original six or seven books, and the first one was was dead. Like the 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 cover was completely shot just from being read so many times. And the second yeah. one was two, and the third one had like a few creases, and books four to six have never been touched. Because <laughs> because Dune is fucking weird, and at some point, it just. Stops. Like I have never read the full thing. I've gotten to the third book, I think, and I have never finished that just because it. I think by the by the third book, no, by the fourth book, I've actually gotten to the fourth book. By the fourth book, you have a time skip of about ten thousand years. None of the characters oh, yeah. you knew, except one, are alive anymore. The one that is still alive also turned himself into a sandworm. Like Dune is fucking weird. What the fuck? Yeah, Dune it's is like... weird. If I haven't made that abundantly clear. <laughs> Remember, we are people who, like, consume a decent amount of anime. So, like, it's not as we... We are not going to be as weirded out, necessarily. Yeah, uh, but Dune is still fucking weird. <laughs> like, that's the thing. If you, if you, if you watch enough anime, you, you get, like, a, like a, a weirdness tolerance. But Dune is so fucked in some respects. It's just... Why is that? But it's fun. Like, it's... Especially I the mean, first book is just really, really good. It's just, it's just a task to read it because it's a lot. I mean, to be fair, that's honestly probably a point in its favor, isn't it? The fact Absolutely. that it's so weird, like it just, it's it's weird, but it's genuine in a way that it's also unique in its weirdness. Yeah, and it's also like Frank Herbert really cared about all of this stuff, like. Imagine this is a book from the 1960s and it's basically about environmentalism. It's is definitely it about... ahead of its time in a big way, it's, yes. It's, 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 it's like on the planet Arrakis, the, the northern hemisphere is where all the story happens and where the sandworms are and where you harvest spice and all that. And everyone assumes nothing is on the southern hemisphere because they they can't put satellites there they say because of the storms and and there's only desert and and giant sandworms who kill everything but and this is not a spoiler because it's like revealed in one of the first chapters but what's actually happening is the the indigenous people of dune the fremen pay the spacing guild in exorbitant amounts of spice so they don't put satellites there so nobody sees that they are basically terraforming the planet because they are pretty much eco-terrorists and what they actually want is for their hellhole of a planet to be habitable this is very yeah, much I a book about that. environmental concerns and that is like from 1963 or 64 or something that's amazing 65 65 okay i don't fucking know i wasn't alive then <laughs> True enough no so so no dune is dune is a very interesting read in part still relevant today definitely in parts, it's just a lot of work to read because, as we said, it's it's a lot. It's it's dense. It's weird. It's strange. It's old and it's wordy, but it's it's amazing. Like when you get through it, you know what you've done. Like it's so amazing. I love it, but I can't read it every year because it's just too much. <laughs> oh yeah. <clears throat> so I um, still have other things. Oh, but someone else I, can I, talk. I, I've also it. heard that. Um... In some respects, Dune has not aged particularly well, though. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's a, what a difficult thing to really uh, comment on properly, because as as Laura has been emphasizing, it's weird, and as a result, there's like things that not so much haven't aged well, but like don't really make a lot of sense no matter what time you're looking at it the thing from. Is, the thing is, every single character in Dune is a staunch feudalist because they all live in a feudalistic society and that's just how they live. But but the, the author just doesn't make a statement on that. At no point does he say we should go back to feudalism or does he say feudalism is bad because that's not what the book is about. That's just... And I can see people saying, well, that hasn't aged well because obviously feudalism is bad, but that's just 
the book is not even equipped to make a statement on that because not a single character could make a statement on that because all of them only know this feudalist system. And that's that's a lot of the things where people say the book hasn't aged well is where I'm going to say, I mean, maybe not, but also these things weren't really what the book spoke for or against when it came out originally. They are just things in the book. I can see that. Um. Anyways, yeah, we can move on from Dune now. Sorry for dragging that out. No, it's it's. I mean, Dune. It's another, it's worth another thing about. I can talk very much about. <laughs> it's, uh, as I said, I've probably read it six or seven times. So yeah. Eesh. Anyway. Yeah. Whenever I tell my dad I'm rereading it, he says, "Why? Why do you hate yourself?" <laughs> I mean, that's fair. Um. Yeah. But another thing I've read uh, this year, which came out 2019, so here I will definitely not do anything about spoilers or anything, um, is called A Memory Called Empire by Arkady Martin. It's a duology. The second book is supposed to be out next year. I've actually and heard heard a lot of things about that series. A lot of people is, I know is very, very recommend. good, I would say. Um, I know Gen was showing it hard. Yeah, and rightfully so. Basically, the, the best thing, thing I can say about it is that they put a, put a blurb by, by Anne Leckie on the front. And personally, I never believe these blurbs. Like, this is not... So, I, I don't believe the authors who quote-unquote recommend books to you actually do that just because these people have other things to do than read books they don't know, I assume. Um, but the best thing I can say about this book is they put her name on the front cover, and it's absolutely justified. It's science fiction in the vein of the Imperial Red trilogy. Uh, the author, Arkady Martin, is actually, I think, a uh, Byzantinist or something. Like, So she knows late Roman history. And mm. the the empire it is set in, the, the science fiction empire it is set in, is very obviously based on the late Roman empire, with uh, just with how the society functions and works. And she obviously just knows how this shit works. So that's that's very, very that makes the book very easy to read. That's also, as I alluded to earlier, this is also a book where people from different cultures just do and do not come together. Like the, the main character is basically an, an ambassador from a, from a space station, which is essentially like a, like an expat colony of the, of the empire. The empire more or less has their army at their front door and they hope sending an ambassador or having an ambassador with the empire will keep the empire from just invading and taking them, which the empire could easily do. Um, for reasons I won't really get into just because they would be minor spoilers. Um, but anyway, the main character is the ambassador of this space station. And she obviously has a, has a contact in the, in the actual empire, like who, who basically is her handler. And the two of them develop a relationship and it, it kind of goes where you think, well, they're obviously going to fuck and they don't. And by the end of the first book, I mean, I assume it's going to happen in the second because let's be real, even in, we know how these stories go. But uh, in the first book, in the end, the, the handler very much says to her something in the veins of, yeah, I'm basically crushing hard on you, but, but you're just not one of us. You're just, you're just too different. And that's a that's a very interesting take for a book about societies coming together to take. Huh, yeah. That's also a very... Because, uh... because, again, it's about people being kind of caught in their biases, even if they don't want to be. Yeah, no, no, that's actually a very good way of showing that, because it's just uh, playing with your expectations is always a great way yeah. of uh, so that's, displaying... That's, that's one I definitely would heavily recommend, but Again, I don't want to say too much just because uh, it's from last year, so spoilers mm. and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I will say, uh, what's interesting is that while I think the premise is interesting, I don't know, I just have a very hard time getting in invested in sci-fi for some reason, unless there's it's there's also magic, but <laughs> I think that's just a... That's just me. And uh, interestingly enough... In a, in a, in a uh, way, in, there are ghosts in this. Like, um, well, yeah, but I, I assume it's just sufficiently advanced technology I mean, being distinguishable. Um, but yeah, so I, 
What's interesting is that that actually uh, ties into my uh, feelings on Anne Leckie as well. The only Anne Leckie novel I've read is The Raven Tower. Yep, that makes also fucking amazing. I have to read that one. <laughs> Great book. It's like, also probably the only second person book I've read that actually like makes sense. Yeah. Second person stuff is kind of strange, but once you get used to it, I imagine it's... And it, oh, it, actually, it ties tying, tying back to what I, what I said earlier, uh, Harrow the Ninth, parts of Harrow the Ninth are actually also written in second person. But that's a very, huh. very good reason for that, and it becomes apparent as you read. Like, uh, like the Raven Tower, like that is something that uh, a lot of people don't don't really play with, because like, yeah, why? basically, because why would you? It's just a strange is a hard thing to perspective do. Perspective to write with, yeah, definitely. And I mean, technically, Raven Tower isn't even a second person book; it's a first person well, book from an entire... from an omnipresent and omnipotent being. Yeah, and that's the thing is that uh, I really, really like Raven Tower. Yeah, it's very good. But I think I understand what... Uh, I understand why uh, you'd say that uh, Anne Leckie is a great author because of Raven Tower, but it's just one of those things where, you know, I kind of... I. Don't, I'm not that into sci-fi. I don't have as much uh, experience. I mean, all, all I can say is, all I can do is recommend her books. Like I probably Imperial Wretch trilogy, like her first trilogy, is another one of these. I probably read them once a year. That I believe the first book is on my really high on my plan to read list. Ancillary Justice is the first one. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm looking forward to what you're saying. Like I I don't think I've met anyone who's read them and hasn't taken something away from it. I can I can honestly say that that book changed how I view the world. Interesting. From what I've heard of her, she's a really great author, so I'm looking forward to reading her books. Yeah. Um yeah, she has five books, the trilogy, then there's Provenance which is, which is set in the same universe as the trilogy but only only very tangentially related to it and Raven Tower which is not a sci-fi but also very very good. All of them come highly recommended, definitely. And as I said, that's pretty much the best thing I can say about a memory called Empires that they put my favorite author on the cover, and I can totally see why. Hmm. Well, that's good. Then. So then, finally, Act there's Rage of Dragons. Oh, yes, Rage of Dragons. That's also another one. It's, uh, no, I've been Ken meaning to build that one in the Discord. So, yeah, I, I want to get your take on it. I have issues. <laughs> yeah, I had. I want to. I want to. I want to preface this by saying this is by no means a bad book, not at all. I'm just coming down very hard on it because the things that great are so very grating to me personally. And that's uh, so totally... it's on your pet names. That's that's yeah. what you're saying. Like I'm. I'm. The thing is, I obviously like the first one enough to also finish it in a day and it's like i don't even know how many pages like 600 pages in a day which is for me a pretty pretty well, decent speed um but i'm not sure i want to read the second one ah i see uh would you like to like uh, are there I mean, obviously... non-spoiler reasons you can share i mean yeah I'm, I'm 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 going to remain spoiler free as far as i can but the thing is, the book builds an incredibly interesting setting. Because it is, on the one hand, your box standard high fantasy setting, but it's also very much not European focused. It's very it's very African. Interesting. And that is definitely interesting. And I have I can confidently say I have not read anything like that before. So quite frankly, it, there's really not enough of that. Absolutely. And and that alone makes the book an interesting read. And the world building is also done very, very well. It it starts with a with a prologue that is very much about why the world is the way it is, or why the not the world, but just why the status quo at the beginning of the story is the way it is, as a prologue should. It it explains to you why the people struggle the way they do. And and I I, I wanted to see something very good done with this setting. And the sad thing is, it doesn't. It tells the most box standard revenge story you can imagine. So and revenge stories come with their own issues because 
often revenge stories do not have particularly likable protagonists because all they want is kill those people. Vengeance! Yes, and and it also I'm I'm not gonna go so far as to say he's a Mary Sue or Gary Stu or whatever, but the protagonist starts very the, good at everything. Not at everything, but he starts the book as explicitly not a very good fighter. And then basically uh. at the at the moment he decides he is a vengeance person now. Like that's the thing. And he just trains super hard and he becomes the best fighter there is. And then he breaks his right arm and trains with his left arm and then he's ambidextrous and kills everyone. And that's just a like I've read that. I've probably written that when I was fourteen. So and what you're saying basically is that in a nutshell, very unique setting, very uh bog standard mediocre execution revenge plot. Yeah, it's 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 a very it's a very frustrating book to me. And it's I can sort of I can see people not being bothered by that, but I, I was. And as I said, I'm not sure I want to read the second one. I will say I probably would uh have a similar take on it then and which really is unfortunate for me because I I'm a big fan of whenever a book or an author decides to go in a uh, non-Eurocentric direction, but like, yeah, it's just like, and this is actually something we touched on earlier in the in the podcast is is that it's not good enough to have a good idea or not like a unique. It's you need to. It's not just that you need to execute it well, but the but that the execution also has to be on par with the quality of the idea yeah. or the quality of the world. I mean, uh, one, one thing that, is, that speaks very much to what, what I found the, so frustrating about the book is at the beginning of the book, there's, a, there's like an attack by whatever evil force, I don't care. Um, and, and the main character is involved in, this, in the defense against this attack because of, because of his status and stuff. Um, and he kills one person. And for the first act of the book, that is genuinely a thing that terrifies him, that he is capable of killing per people. And I really like that. Like, that's a, that's a good thing for a protagonist to have because most protagonists don't, let's be frank, don't really care if they murder someone. That's actually something that, that uh, the 13th Paladin, which I read recently as yeah. I was talking about, it goes into is that the first time the protag, uh, and basically every time the protag kills someone, he's just like, he's trying his best to resolve things as yeah. much as possible. And his uh, mentor actually goes through and tells him that it's a very good thing that he's having that reaction because... Yeah. If it gets to the point where you either enjoy it or even if you're just numb to it, or actually it phrases it like this, that people who enjoy it are dangerous, but mostly to themselves. And the people who are numb to it are the most dangerous because they will like, for them, it becomes a numbers game, right? Yeah. Like it's not people anymore, but rather just it's a series of numbers. Yeah. So and, I think it's- And the thing is, yeah, sorry. No, no, no. I was gonna yeah. give it more. No, and the thing is, the and the first act that's genuinely a thing he has to struggle with. But again, at the point he decides, no, I'm a vengeance guy now. He doesn't care. He doesn't give a fuck. He just goes murdering. Oh no! There I go, killing again. Yeah, and and that's just that's again that's so frustrating. And you can't do that. You can do that where you move your character from one point to that other point. But you have to actually do the work. You can't just do it. It's, uh, a lot of authors, I've, I've seen that this is kind of a trend uh, in recent history, is that uh, they try to have their cake and eat it too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's, that's another thing that actually I noticed about the book, like that may have been my personal interpretation and not actually be in the book. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but... It feels like the society this book is set in is very much ruled by status. Like if you if you're a noble, you have these privileges. If you're like a lesser noble, you only have these privileges, and and so on and so on. And I feel like the author is very much coming out and saying, yeah, classism is bad, which is okay, not the most novel take, but certainly a not take you can have as well. 
Honestly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a bad take, take, yeah. but it's a good like, take. Yeah, but it's it's a good take exactly. If if that's your story, cool. But throughout the story, the guy gets rewarded with status again and again and again, ah. and it's always framed as a reward, and that's so. Ah, so classism is only bad when you're not part of the ruling class, essentially. Kind of. Like, again, this it's is more the first... classism is bad when there's, like, a, when you're not getting rewarded by bumping up your class status. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, this is the first book in a trilogy, so I don't want to say the author can't do that. Like, it's very much possible that by the later books, it, it comes around to, well, because these people only understand classism and only think they have to reward people with this status. And so that's what happens. That can certainly happen. But throughout this book, it, it kind of felt like, like, like baby's first socialism. I don't know. It's, it's, yeah. I, I do. I like that a lot. <laughs> I love that, that, that phrasing. <laughs> so, yeah, I found this book to be very frustrating because all the setting and world stuff I really liked. Some of the side characters I really liked. Some others were very, very, very uninteresting. And I genuinely don't remember a single name. But again, they were like the one who's good at talking, the big brood, and the the coward, and the crafty one. Like, yeah. Ah, that's you, I... you go. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that was very frustrating. Like, yeah, I liked the world. I didn't really enjoy the story or the characters very much. I'm I don't want to say I'm not going to read the second one because there is potential here so maybe I will but at maybe the same time wait to see what the reviews say Yeah at the same time also this is the last book I finished like I finished this 2 weeks ago or something so it's still very fresh the frustration is very very fresh so I I might I might come around to it yeah, but this is a yeah. if you might yeah. feel better about it with some distance then Yeah but yeah, as of things... right now I'm not sure about wanting to read the second one that's an entirely fair take, honestly. It it sounds like something I'd want to read for myself to get an op my opinion on it, because it sounds like it has potential as a yeah. series as a whole. It just sounds like it's a rough start to the series. Yeah, that's that's why that's why I started out with this is definitely not a bad book. It's I I don't I don't feel comfortable saying to people don't read this. This has issues, which it definitely has, because there is definitely potential here. It's just I. When I finished with it, I was like, okay, I guess. Eh? And that's not really a feeling you want when you put a book down. No. That's, yeah, I, I can totally well, understand. You want one of two feelings when you put a book down. Either one, one, either I feel like this book was a complete package, or two, where the fuck is the next book in this series? Yeah. I, I, I hate and love that, that sadness when you finish a book or a series of books. And I feel it's like just... empty. Side, yeah. Right? Uh, oh and god. I, way with the I, lawn I I love putting a book on the shelf and standing in front of my shelf and thinking, okay, what are you going to read next? And just being unable to decide because the the emotions and the feelings yeah, of yeah, being yeah. with those characters even... are still so fresh, you just can't even think about spending time with anything else. I love you know it. It's been a while cool. since a book made me cry like that. Cry is, and still made me love it for doing that. Yeah. You know what's even worse, though, is uh, when you find a new series that really, really connects with you, and you just rush through it, and then you realize, wait, when... oh no, the series is not done, and the next book isn't out yet. I know. I read, oh, God. I read Gideon the Ninth and Harrow the Ninth on two days, and the third book is out in 2022. I'm oh, no. clawing at the walls. <laughs> how do you, Fuzzy, how the fuck do you think I feel when I just caught up on... Uh on uh, Stormlight and then I realized oh wait, I have to read it, I have to wait another year for the next book and now I have to wait three more years after I finish the book I'm on Yeah, yeah, I can understand why that would be uh, difficult for you but at the same time uh, it, it's, it's like Stormlight is kind of a unique uh, it's kind of its own entity, right? Yeah, Stormlight Stormlight is pretty unique. A lot of series have their own uh, unique identity, but Stormlight is particularly its own thing. Regardless, still good. Uh, still read a lot this year, all of us. You in particular, fuzzy? 
You're gonna have to post that list of all the shit you've read at some point. Uh, so I I know how to bring it up on my phone, but I have no idea how to actually like bring it up. You might have to type it out. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm capable of that sort of thing. Or you could just take screenshots. Yeah, I'll probably have to do that. I'll have to figure out how to get it on my actual Amazon account. And bear in mind that estimate of 109. That is only the books I've read on Kindle. I've read a lot more books outside of Kindle, and as well, I've been keeping up Fucking with a lot. A. Fucking A. Fucking A. Holy shit. Yeah, so I think 109 might also be a bit overly optimistic, all things considered. How do you fuck do you lowball that number? Um, <laughs> that's just how it be sometimes. I'm. I don't know. I, I don't know whether to be the scared or or impressed. Yeah, I had a strong book for for me is a strong run this summer where like for a month I read one book each Saturday and that was it. But that was all the time I had. And that's still a lot. Like yeah, a I mean that was that was pretty good for me. Pretty big chunk, and if, especially uh, if you all in just one day. Actually, yeah, Axiom's End was the first one of those. Then the two Lock Tomb books, Gideon and Harrow the Ninth, and the third one that was The Memory Called Empire. Those took me each one day to read. God damn! But that was literally the whole day. Like I got up, started reading, made, took a few breaks to eat, and that was it. <laughs> but honestly, a, a good book does that. Like. Yeah, no. Put a good book down. That's it's one just... of the signs of a good book is that, like, you just lose the time. If you don't lose I time. I started then... reading them on Saturdays because I knew, okay, I probably want to have time for this. See, part of the reason I'm so frustrated by not getting uh, so many books done is because, like, I would have had more time if I didn't have work. Mm, yeah, that that's, is... that's what broke my streak. I graduated and started working, and then I just didn't have the time to read like that anymore. I'll do it. That yeah. will do it. <laughs> Anyway, it's fucking 3 a.m. here. I oh shit! Oh god. Okay. Uh, well, as as it turns out, we are just about finished, more or less. Uh, any parting thoughts? Uh, it was fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it, we we're always. I mean, that's kind of the thing we've always been going for, and we are glad we actually managed to get someone other than our usual crew. So, thank you for being here. Thank um, you for joining us, Lord. Yeah, but with that, uh, I will say um, it's been a fun time. And as it turns out, when you have a lot of people who are very passionate about a book series or about a t particular piece of media, i.e. books in this case, it's, you lose t track of time just talking about it. But that's really the magic of it. And... Thank you for joining us today, everyone. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Lore, for uh, being uh, part of our crew today. And thank you to anyone who watches the VOD. And if you are willing, please give us a follow on Twitch or a subscription on YouTube. It helps out a great deal if you're watching the archive. And have a good night, everyone. Thank you, and have a good have night. A good night.